Good morning. Uh, this is a talk on the life at the family bar. Um, I'm Neil Owen Casey, and we've got Andrew Powell here, and we've got Lisa Tuckwell, and you can see Lisa um, is the youngest of us all. Um, <laughs> 2017 call. Um, we're not quite sure where Sean Hughes is. She must have got a last minute brief and been detained. <laughs> Hopefully, not at Her Majesty's pleasure. Right. Um, we want to try and give you an insight into what it's like at the family bar. Um, we come at it from various perspectives. Um, Andrew and I actually did our pupillage together. Um, there is an age gap between us. Andrew is a little bit younger than me. Um, whereas Lisa was a family solicitor before she came to the bar. So she can tell you um, uh, more about that transition because for some people who don't get to pupillage, uh, the first port of call might be to train as a solicitor and perhaps look at the bar um, further on down the line. Um, we all practice in family law. Um, I'm the more generalist, so I'd say about 75% of my practice is care proceedings, um, but I also do money work and I also specialise in court of protection work, which is um, its own jurisdictional area, but is very much uh, something which a lot of the family bar do get involved in. Andrew does um, a lot of care work. He doesn't do money work, but he has a very uh, budgeting international practice, and he's very much into uh, fertility um, and uh, alternative family structure type problems. Um, and he's becoming one of the leading experts at junior level in that area of law. Lisa practices primarily in um, matrimonial work. So we all have our broad areas. Um, so we can take questions on that. But what is life like at the family bar? Well, I came to the bar as a, a more mature entrant in my early 30s, having had a, a career as a professional musician. So I was well used to being self-employed, um, living hand to mouth, and having to travel to far-flung places around the country for very little reward. Um, so not a lot has changed uh, in, in, the, in the 11 years I've been at the bar. Um, I would say, though, that the, the, the rewards on a personal level are much greater. Um, and I would say I have um, some job security now. You know? Um, I know what I'm doing in three months' time, for example. I didn't know that as a musician. Um, but it was a difficult transition because the biggest hurdle I had was to try and persuade a Chambers that I was not some fly-by-night candidate. I had a genuine commitment to the bar. And I was leaving my career as a musician behind. I'd studied music up to master's level. I was a professional conductor and trombone player. And they looked at me and said, well, why do you want to become a barrister? And I said, well, it's just the same thing. We get to wear silly clothes, and we like to stand up and be the centre of attention. Now, that may have rung true in some respects, but of course, obviously, it diverges very quickly from there. Um, but if you are coming to the bar as a mature student, you've got to find your unique selling point. And you've got to show and say the, the, the commitment that you've got to that set of chambers. When you apply for pupillage, you list quite a few chambers. I forget how many it is. Is it 10 or 12 options you have? 20. 20. Wow. Um, it used to be 12. And, and yet the number of pupillages has gone down. I think when Andrew and I did it, there was about four, just over 400 pupillages given out that year, 450 maybe. Um, I, I think it's dipped under 400 now. Um, yet you get more choices. Now, arguably, the pessimists will say, well, that's more rejections. Um, there we go. So how can you cut through all that? Well, I say you, you find a uni unique selling point. You have to show commitment, commitment to the family bar, um, and commitment to each of the chambers that you're applying to. And inevitably, if you're applying to 20 different chambers, they're not all going to be in London, or they're not all going to be in Birmingham or in Manchester, where you, you may be living. So the reality now is you've got to look across the country at all the, the various circuits. Um, and then when if you do uh, end up in that fortunate position of getting an interview, you've got from the get-go to be persuading them, I am committed to moving from Brighton to Leeds or, or whatever the case may be. So that's going to be your first hurdle. Then the next hurdle is why I'm changing career, for example. Um, or if it's, that's not the question that you're being faced with, is why should we take you when you've only just come out of university and you've got no life experience? Because one of the things that we will all say uh, you experience at the family bar, it's one of the few areas of law where everything that the court has to decide is about balance. 
It's about grey areas. It's not like crime, where there's um, an objective um, set of criteria, and either you've, you traverse some and you're in trouble, and then you get sentenced or not. In family law, it's not like that. It is touchy-feely, yes, but it's just about grey areas and it's about finding the balance. And of course, when we're dealing with children, that is the focal point of everything we do. That's our overriding duty, to make sure the court can do what is best for that child. But what is best for one child isn't what's best for another child. When you start looking at the complexities of families, modern families, example, mm. um, international families, just families that live at one end of the UK to the other, they present very difficult day-to-day, -day, realistic, gritty problems that we have to try and find solutions for as family barristers. We are trying to find solutions which, on the face of it, m may not be there. So you take a family that is doing very, very well, um, the husband earns quarter of a million pounds a year, the wife doesn't have to work or she has a little job in a, sounds like one of your cases, sounds like she has a little job in a, a corner shop but they have a fantastic house, they have great cars, great holidays and then one of them goes off and has an affair. The whole thing comes crashing down. It's not just the matrimonial side you've got to deal with, it's how do you then improve the or make sure that you progress and give opportunity to the relationship between the children of that family and the parent who ends up moving out. Traditionally, it may be the husband, but it's not always the case. And what happens if then that husband is actually an international businessman and he says, well, I'm going back to Australia to live now and I'm taking the kids with me. How do you deal with that? These are the kind of problems that we deal with in the family court. And it, it, there's no right and wrong solution sometimes. Um, but we have to try and manage expectations of the client. We have to negotiate with the other side to see how we can narrow the issues. Let's take a care case. You are faced with a young girl, age 19, mental health problems, and she's just given birth to a child. But it's not a first child, it's actually a third child. How do you explain to her that given her difficulties and her background past, oh, and she was a child that was in the care system herself, so she's got no faith in the system, how do you then persuade her that you can find a way forward to try and improve her life and improve that of the, the child that she's just given birth to? difficult problems. Um, my very first case was a very notorious case. It, um, my people master threw the papers at me and he said, have a look at that. Um, little did I know within weeks it, I was involved in a baby pee case. Mm. Okay? Uh, and that was my baptism of fire at the bar. And that's the kind of work that I, I do now. Um, and one of the questions I've been asked on the, the FLBA stand today is, well, how do you deal with the emotional baggage that comes with a case and how do you protect yourself from that and, and that's very very difficult because you are like a therapist in many respects you have to listen to what your client is telling you if it's a, a matrimonial case they could be telling you how awful the other person is and they just pour out all this poison to you and you're just sitting there listening to it. Now, quite often, I will always ring up the solicitor the night before and say, you are coming to court tomorrow, aren't you? Because I need you there to sort of be the, the emotional sponge. But sometimes you haven't got that. And quite often in a care case, you don't have a solicitor at court with you. You've got to deal with all that. So the family bar, from my point of view, is not for people who are overly sensitive. You've got to have a reasonably thick skin. But at the same time, you've got to show the right level of empathy and you've got to win that trust from your client that you are doing the best you can for them, even if the outcome of the case is glaringly obvious that they're not going to get their child back or, or whatever. You've got to find a way of managing that um, and quite often try and set them on the path if they have more children. How can the situation be different going forward? Maybe Andrew can talk to you about the more international side of it um, and his experience at the bar. <laughs> I'll just give you a, a brief overview of my background. So I uh, came to the bar 10 years ago, um, grew up in Birmingham. My mum is a nurse, my dad's an electrician, came from a very ordinary background, went to a state school in Birmingham, one of the biggest at the time. And coming to the bar was, was a kind of a, gosh, I, I don't think I can be a barrister. This is kind of like people who aren't like me. I don't know how I can do that. Um, but I applied, got through, got pe many people to did pupillage um, and here I am. That's a bit of a, a, a short overview of how I, how I got there. In terms of the work that I do, um, as Neil said, a, a lot of my work is international work. 
So often involving kind of jurisdictional issues about children who are either in this jurisdiction and there's an issue about whether they should be um, in another jurisdiction or children who have been removed from this jurisdiction where they were living and taken to another country and there's an argument about whether the child should be brought back from that country. So there can be often complex and difficult issues but I think as Neil quite rightly pointed out with family law you're dealing with people's emotions and obviously you're not there as a therapist, you're not there as a social worker, you're there as their advocate but often it can feel like you become all three of those roles and I think the beauty about family law is that it trans all aspects of society. So you can be representing, as Neil said, the teenager who is an IV, IV drug user who herself has been through the care system and is now having a child possibly removed from her care from the labour ward. The next day you can be representing a multimillionaire in their financial remedy dispute. Um, the next day you can be representing a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, um, a stay-at-home mum all sorts. So you're seeing all sorts of people and so I think the thing about family law is that when you're thinking about applying to family sets is that your, 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 your unique selling point is has got to be people related in some respect because you've got to be a bit like a chameleon because as I say those people require often a different approach and so a case can demand a client who needs very firm and clear advice Conversely, it might require somebody to be very, um, uh, perhaps not touchy-feely, but kind of sensitive, but also very clear. So you've got to have um, an ability to adapt to the needs of your client. And so no day is the same. I think from a general point of view, I think the one thing I would say to anybody who is keen to come to the family bar, and that's why you're all here, um, is that you've got to have stamina. You've got to have a lot of stamina. Um, I have weeks where, and Lisa and I were just talking about this earlier, ha where you can get up at you know, 5, 6 a.m., go to chambers, do a bit of work till 9 a.m., go off to court, come back at 4, receive papers for tomorrow, leave chambers at 9, go home, eat, work till 1, get up at 5 again and repeat. It's not like that every day, but it can be like that. So you've got to have that kind of sense of what you're signing up to. Is, it's quite a tough job, but it's thoroughly rewarding. I think after 10 years I can definitely say that because there was a point maybe five or six years ago where I thought to myself, God, this is, this is hell, like, you know, <laughs> what are we doing? But actually you are, you are, you've got a job that is socially, you can say is socially responsible, actually, because you're trying to be a problem solver for somebody. It, it might not necessarily be a case where um, it's not going to have a huge impact on society, but it has a huge impact on that person. That person who wants to have closure in their, in their, in their life from their ex-partner to just walk away, sell the home, divvy up the assets. That person who wants to see their child again, having been um, excluded from their, their child's life for the best part of five years. Or that person who wants to get their kid back who's been abducted to X country. So you're having a micro impact, but a fairly significant one. And without it sounding too cheesy, that's, that's quite a nice thing to do. Um, and so, uh, if you want to come to the family bar, you've, as I say, you've got to have stamina and ultimately what you're doing is, is a job that is, is helping people, but it's helping people and finding solutions um, through, often through the courts. Um, perhaps we can hand Lisa. to Lisa and then we can go to... Actually, I'm Lisa Tuckwell and I came to the bar in quite a, a unique way, I think. Um, I didn't go to university, um, I didn't have A-levels. I was a legal exec. I started as a, a legal secretary for a firm and I worked for a very great solicitor who was a part-time judge and he said to me one day, why don't you do more with you know, what you can do? So I studied to become a legal exec. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's what I did. I became a legal exec while working full-time. I then became a partner in a law firm and that was the first partner, legal exec partner in the country when the laws changed. I then became a solicitor working full-time and studying, doing my LPC part-time. Then I decided I'd become a solicitor advocate because I loved advocacy. I did that while working full time running a firm. <laughs> and then I decided to come to the bar. Two years ago I thought, I love it. I did all that and I became, I called uh, last July and it was the best, for me, the best day of my life. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. So I was a, a solicitor, a lawyer for 20 years doing family. Coming to the bar is completely different, completely different, but it's great. and. Um, 
the word empathy was used by you, it's exactly what you have to be. You're dealing with people's lives and if you haven't got empathy, don't even think about it because, you know, some people say, well, you know, that person, look at their life, care clients. <coughs> Put yourself in their shoes. That's what I say. So when I'm representing a client, I think I'm their voice. That's what we are as an advocate with their voice. Put yourself in their shoes and express. So you might have, and I've only been doing care a year. I spoke to Andrew about this. And I had a client the other day, totally hopeless, hopeless. She'd had five children removed. We knew it was going to happen. But dear God, did I fight for her because that's what she wanted. So she was saying all of these things, which wouldn't have made much of a difference but I was there to tell the judge this and the judge listened and at the end of the day she knew what was going to happen but I was her voice and I'd said what she wanted to say and just what mother or father is going to say have my child it just it doesn't happen does it so even in the most hopeless of cases you put your client's case across and then I have cases where I did money matrimonial finances they can be the most entertaining of all because people argue about the most ridiculous things. The, you know, we're arguing about a tea set because Aunt Nelly gave it to, you know. You get that and you can go to final hearing arguing about stupid things like that. So my advice to you when coming to, to the bar is it is a great profession. Um, you meet lots of people. You meet great people. You meet not so great people. Um, don't let anyone put you down, okay? Because when I started, a lot of people were uh, dismissive of me. They see my call, they think I'm a bit of an umpty. <laughs> but don't ever underestimate your opponent because there are great people out there and newly qualified barristers can be just as, as challenging as somebody who's been, do you agree? Yeah. 20 yeah. years. Do not underestimate your opponent and be polite. We all have a job to do. So when you go, go to court, you can get someone who's being, don't, don't go to that level. Retain your integrity because judges, the judges where I sit and I am a long time, know that when I come in, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to mislead anybody and I'm not going to try and pull a fast one. Always keep your integrity. I would say the cons of being a barrister, and we spoke about this, is um, you have to think on your feet. Uh, you might be in court thinking this is all going really swimmingly and then a curveball will come in. That's when you've got to really do your job because when you're doing a case and it's all going well, we can make it look easy because it is easy. When something happens in that trial, your client says something that you weren't expecting. <laughs> you can't just stop the hearing and you know, rewind. You've got to deal with it. So you've got to think on your feet. The other thing is you have to get used to, and this is what I struggled with initially, I'll do a case on the Monday. What am I doing tomorrow? You've got this case. Four o'clock, that case has come out, but don't worry, you've got another case. So you have, sometimes you get half an hour to prepare. I'm running down the road from my chambers, reading the papers, trying not to get run over on my way to court, <laughs> meet the client, you know, have an idea of what I'm doing, and then straight into court. So don't think you're going to get a week to prepare and it's all going to be amazing, because it's not. But for me, I think it's the best job in the world. That's my thought. So I would really encourage, and it's nice to see such a diverse amount of people here in ages, I would really encourage it. And applying for pupillage, put something on your CV that makes you stand out. Because it's about personality. You can all have the most amazing CVs. You've got a first, you've done this, you've done that. It's not, my CV isn't great. I didn't go to university. Some people might sniff at that and say, well, why would I want her? I've got life experience and I've got empathy and I can talk to anybody and that's what Andrew said you have to be a chameleon you have to talk to somebody that's got learning difficulties that's got an IQ of a 10 year old and then you might be talking to Alan Sugar the next day so or not <laughs> but just <laughs> yeah that's that's how diverse so that's that's what I would say and just keep trying get your person personality out there because that's what we're interested in and that's what judges want um, before we move to Sean, um, Andrew and uh, Lisa have raised a really important point. Um, I, I don't know Sean's background, she might disprove this theory, but we've come from very diverse backgrounds to get to where we are now. Um, similarly, I came from a, a council estate in Swansea. I was the first in my family to go to university. My father was a milkman. 
right? And a lot of people have this perception, well, if you're going to go to the bar, you've got to go to Oxbridge, mm -hmm. you've got to have parents who are lawyers. and th That's not the case anymore, right? It used to be, um, but it, that, that's no longer the case. But I think what Lisa says, the life experience point is very valid. Um, and young 20-year-olds can have a lot of life experience and sometimes can have more life experience than somebody who's in their late 30s and early 40s. Right, so th that's why the family bar is so diverse and it needs to maintain that diversity of people from all walks of life, all ages, all backgrounds, because that's how we, as a, uh, as a part of the bar, best serve the clients that we deal with every day. Sean, how do you get to the bar? Um, first of all, sorry, I got caught up at the application clinic. Um, so how did I get to the bar? I also am Welsh. Um, I grew up in North Wales. Shall I come like yeah, I can um, <laughs> uh, so I, I grew up um, on Anglesey in North Wales um, and I also didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge um, <clears throat> and decided that I wanted to go for the bar. I went to university in Leicester and then realised after I graduated that actually it's super competitive, became really disheartened that I would never make it. Um, it decided I was going to plough on anyway, um, and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, I got a job at the Law Commission after university, which was a stroke of luck. Um, I turned up there on my first day thinking it was this kind of cool, Gucci, sexy legal research job, um, and I remember I was the only non-Oxbridge person there that put the fear of God in me because I thought, oh gosh, how am I going to compete with this? Um, but you realise that you do, actually, because you bring different things to the table. And actually, I think that's what you have to remember going through the pupillage process. So if you don't have a double first from Oxford, a actually doesn't even matter, but you have other unique selling points and you just have to ham those up. So I had loads of pro bono experience, and so that's what I went in talking about to interviews. Um, I also had worked at the Law Commission, so that was something different to talk about. And I also really tried to convey my personality in <laughs> interviews, and I mean, it may have paid off, and it clearly didn't pay off in other instances, but I'm actually really glad that I had that attitude and that's something that I've tried to take with me during pupillage um, in that I think it's really important to be yourself. I think that's really important. And in this, work, like this legal world where it's all a bit strange where we go and dine in hall with like weird cloaks on and we all talk about law and like what we want to reform and like bits of judgments that I, some people care about, others don't. You, you have to, I think it is really important to be yourself and to not be afraid to be yourself. And I think the family bar is somewhere that really embraces you being yourself. Like know your, your own unique selling points, know exactly who you are and, and stick to that. Don't try and be anyone else because these are people who, bar barristers who will be interviewing you and you know, you'll, be alongside during pupillage. These are people who create factual matrix all the time. And so if you're trying to create one, they'll see through it, first of all. Um, but I also think that it will be quite tough for you because it's a long time to try and not be yourself and you don't want to get to tendency and then be somebody that you actually haven't been for all of that time. So I think interviews, yeah, I realised that actually it was just quite important to embrace who I was, that my journey was a bit different, that I wasn't afraid of that, I brought different things to the table and I really pushed those things. Um, and now that I'm doing pupillage, I'm still trying to kind of remain true to that. And I think that there's a separate point in that as well about knowing who you are, what you bring to the table, is that it allows you <clears throat> to take care of your well-being and I think that's something that's really important at the bar because going through this process, like doing all of these mini pupillages and 
kind of finding all of these mentors that were helping me along the way, you realise that at the bar, people generally, and the panel can disagree with me, but I, I don't feel like people really do take care of their well-being. Agree. Um, it's just not really a thing. Like Talking about well-being at the bar, just it, it isn't a buzzword. Nobody talks about well-being. Um, and I think that we, as, as people who are like now coming to the bar, have a duty to now think about well-being at the bar and, and talk about it and for it to become something that's, that's really at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, it, it's odd that chambers have no HR departments, for right. example. It's really, it, it's... Uh, I, think, yeah. I think the culture in the last, say, maybe... 12 months to two years has changed mm. a bit yeah. and certainly our chambers has introduced a well-being policy oh, really? in the last 12 months yeah. so I think there's definitely a push towards mm. it um, whether people are actually individually <laughs> thinking about their well-being is a, is a different question but I think the culture is changing bit by bit yeah. it's slow I mean the bar is slow to change